Good morning. Thank you for joining us for Bible class. We are glad you're here with us online as we continue our study of the Gospel of John. We left off last week in John chapter 3. If you got your Bibles, turn over there. That's where we'll begin our time and move into chapter 4 today. We had looked last week at those most popular verses from John chapter 3 there in verse 16 and all that John says there about God loving the world so much that he gave his only begotten son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. And I encouraged you last week, if you memorize John 3.16, if that's a verse that means a lot to you, go ahead and learn verse 17 as well. For God did not send his son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through him might be saved. And we looked on at what John says after that. As we moved through, we got down into verse 22. And we left off the, the narrative section, or the, the discourse section there, moved into a narrative time. Jesus and his disciples come into the land around Judea, and they're there, and they begin baptizing. John is nearby, and he and his disciples are baptizing. And verse 25 is where we left off specifically. It says, Then there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. We don't read of a dispute between John's disciples and Jesus' disciples, at least not directly and certainly not yet. But it says there arose a dispute between some of John's disciples and the Jews about purification. And as we look at that, it might tell us a little bit of something about what was going on there. The Jewish ritual of purification was a ritual of washing. In fact, the word that they used for that was to baptize to immerse something. They would take an object or a person even and they would be immersed and that was part of their ritual for purification, for cleansing. And they did that to objects to make them holy. They would immerse their hands. They even said they would baptize their hands. When someone wanted to become a Jew, they would immerse themselves. No one did it to them, but they would immerse themselves. And that was a baptism as well. All of that was part of a ceremonial cleanliness that they were aiming for. And so it appears that some of the Jews looked at what John was doing and they said, hey, what you're doing is different. Remember, John the Baptist is the first person in recorded history to baptize another person. Baptism was always something you did to yourself as part of your initiation into a group or, or a religious uh, group. But John came along and he baptized someone else. And it appears that now this has caught the attention of the Jews. And they began to say, hey, why does your teacher baptize other people? Shouldn't we baptize ourselves? And there's this dispute that begins to arise. But it seems that there's something else, as is often the case. John's, uh, John's disciples and the Jews are arguing. And verse 26 says, They came to John and said to him, Rabbi, he who was with you beyond the Jordan, to whom you've testified, behold, he's baptizing, and all are coming to him. So perhaps the fact that Jesus and his disciples were nearby and were baptizing, that became the cause of the dispute. When John's disciples come to John and talk to him, they don't have anything to say about this dispute with the Jews. They want to talk about Jesus and his disciples. And their concern seems to be that Jesus is a threat to them. This was John's claim to fame. This is what drew the crowds. John was the one who preached about a baptism of repentance. John was the one who baptized other people so much so that he had gotten the nickname John the Baptizer, John the Baptist. And now somebody else is coming along and they say, hey, hey, John, he's copying us. His people are doing your thing. You're the baptizer, and now this Jesus guy and his disciples, they're doing baptism. And the idea was that if somebody besides you is doing baptisms, then it hurts you. It makes you look bad. In fact, what, look at what they say. He's baptizing, and all are coming to him. They, they say, hey, wait a minute. He's doing the baptizing, and now all of a sudden everybody wants to go to him. Nobody's going to come to you anymore, John. He, he's going to get bigger and better than you. And it was very important to John's disciples. In spite of the fact that people were still coming to John, in spite of the fact that John was still baptizing, they said, no, everybody's going to him. It seems that some of John's disciples didn't really understand all the teaching that John had given. John knew his role. He knew that he was a herald. He was a forerunner. He knew and understood how this was supposed to work. But not every one of his followers did. Maybe we could learn a lesson 
from Jesus or from John and his followers about Jesus and some of his followers. You know, those of us who claim to be Christians who say, yes, we are following Jesus' footsteps. We are, we're a disciple of Jesus, a student, a learner of Jesus. We would also say, but we don't always get it right. We don't always understand everything as we should. And sometimes we have to go back and say, oh, Jesus said that and I, I didn't get it quite right. Here, John's disciples, his followers, didn't get his teaching quite right. William Temple stated, it's hard to lead multitudes and find that another is leading great multitudes. It's harder still to rejoice at it. John's disciples come to him and they say, hey, we got a problem. Jesus and his disciples, they're a problem. And that's the setting for what turns out to be the last recorded words of John the Baptist in this gospel. Verse 27, John answered and said, A man can receive nothing unless it has been given to him from heaven. You yourselves bear me witness that I said, I am not the Christ, but I have been sent before him. He who has the bride is the bridegroom, but the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. Therefore, this joy of mine is fulfilled. He must increase, but I must decrease. John says to them, he gives this great principle as he starts out. He says, hey, wait a minute. A man can receive nothing unless it is given to him from heaven. That's a powerful thing to say. John says the truth is we all have a gift and a role from God. We've been given a job to do. And we don't get to dictate that to God. We don't get to say, here's what I want. Instead, we get to do what we've been asked to do. A man can receive nothing unless it's been given to him from heaven. John has this view of the sovereignty of God that says, you know what? God's given me exactly what he wanted me to have, and he's told me exactly what he wants me to do. And the best thing I can do is do what he's asked me to do with what he's given me to do it with. John says a man can receive nothing except that it's given to him by heaven. And then John says, look at what else he says. You yourselves bear me witness. You guys know, think about what I said. And John does this great thing as a teacher. He says, I told you this. I know you missed it, but I told you this. Go back and think about what I said. Remember what I said. It's Jesus who's going to say to the apostles that the Holy Spirit will bring to mind all the things which I have taught you. And here John says, let me bring to mind the things that I taught you. You're my disciples. You were with me. You can bear witness. I never once claimed to be the Christ. In fact, I said, I am not the Christ. Instead, he said, I've been sent before him. I'm a herald. I'm the one who is to announce his coming. John knew his role. Instead of resenting the popularity of Jesus, John knew he was partly responsible for it. His job was to go ahead and, and to clear the way. John was the epitome of humility because he said, hey, if Jesus is getting more and more credit, if Jesus is increasing, then I've done my job. And that's all I ever wanted to do. Understanding his role, taking responsibility for his role, eliminated all thoughts of competition or rivalry. He was there to make Jesus look good. He was there to prepare the way for Jesus so that the crowds would come to Jesus when he showed up. And then John drew an illustration that maybe we don't understand completely. In verse 29, he, he says, I want you to think about a wedding. And he compares himself to the friend of the bridegroom. We might call that role the best man. The image of the bridegroom was one that every Jew would recognize. It's a good Old Testament imagery, in fact. The picture was that Israel was the bride and she was married to God. He was the bridegroom. And unlike today, where the father of the bride generally walks the bride down the aisle and presents her to the groom, in a good Jewish wedding, it was the role of the friend of the bridegroom, the best man, who walked the bride down the aisle and presented her to the groom. There was a great ceremony, and the friend of the bridegroom was responsible for all these details of everything and planning it all out. And so he would go to all the trouble. He was the wedding planner in many ways. And he would go to all this to set everything up. And John said, you know what? The, the friend of the bridegroom has an important job before the wedding ever takes place. And he works on all those details. And then there is that moment when he walks the bride down the aisle and presents her to the groom. And he says, he who has the bride is the bridegroom. So, so the, the couple ends up married. They're the ones that, are, that, to get, that get together together. But is the friend of the bridegroom who stands and hears him and rejoices greatly because of the bridegroom's voice. 
the moment when the best man would, would hand the bride off. And the ceremony would take over now as the bride and the groom together would go through the rest of that ceremony. The best man's job was done to a large degree and he could sit back and just say, I did my job and enjoy the rest of the wedding. And he celebrated to hear them exchange their vows and to go through the rest of that ceremony. It was a great joy to him because he knew especially how much work he had put into that. And this was everything he was looking forward to. In a similar way, John says, my task is to bring people to Jesus. I, I want to get Jesus and these people together. I want to arrange a marriage, as it were. That's my goal. And so the moment people get together with Jesus, I sit back and say, mission accomplished, job well done. All the work I put in, all the planning and preparation, it all has come together exactly as I had hoped. Therefore, John says, verse 29, this joy of mine is fulfilled. I can sit back and say, job done, job well done. And John says in verse 30, he must increase, but I must decrease. From this point on, it's up to Jesus and the people and their relationship. John says, I've done my job. Now it's up to them. And the last words of John the Baptist to be recorded in the gospel are probably one of the greatest Words, a set of words of humility that ever fell from human lips. Verse 31 begins what appears to be the gospel writer John. John the Apostle's comments on this. And there's some difference about that. And your Bible may decide where to put the quotation marks and move that around. But it seems likely now that we're talking about someone who is writing after the church has already been established. Which would fit John the Apostle. Who, who, as he looked back and wrote the words of this gospel, he looks back to that moment with John the Baptist, to that moment when John the Baptist said, he must increase and I must decrease. And now John the Apostle could say, and boy, did Jesus ever increase. Look at what happened after that. And with the benefit of hindsight, John the Apostle said, let's look back at that a little bit. Verse 31 says, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is earthly and speaks of the earth. As John writes here, he says Jesus had to increase and become greater. And John the Baptist had to decrease and become less because Jesus was from above. Consequently, he was above all. He came from heaven. John was of the earth, as John the, Baptist, or John the Apostle would say. Since John the Baptist was of the earth, inevitably he was going to decrease and fade. Since Jesus was from heaven, inevitably he was going to increase and be greater because he was above all all he who comes from heaven is above all verse 32 says and what he has seen and heard that he testifies and no one receives his testimony john said there's another reason why jesus has to increase and i must decrease jesus was greater because he had firsthand knowledge of what he what he talked about john says the kingdom of heaven is at hand jesus said this is what the kingdom of heaven is like John said, you need, to, you need to prepare for heaven. And Jesus said, I've been there. I can tell you about it because I came from there. Jesus spoke of what he had seen and heard. Because he was from above, he was in a position to know what he was talking about in a way that no human ever could. So whatever Jesus said was reliable because he had seen and heard what he testified about firsthand. When he said, God says this, he spoke with authority that no one else could speak with. And yet... John the Apostle writes, no one receives his testimony. Again, this is a theme we've seen throughout John's gospel already, that light has come into the world, but men loved darkness. They chose the darkness. So Jesus shows up and he has testimony from above, but no one receives his testimony. The important thing here is that didn't invalidate Jesus' testimony. The fact that some folks didn't accept it didn't mean that, that it wasn't true. Because Jesus spoke about what he had seen and heard. His words were true, whether we believed them or not. In fact, he goes on and he says there in verse 33, He who has received his testimony has certified that God is true. When John says no one, obviously it's not an absolute that everyone rejected it, but lots of people did. The, the majority of people did. But for those who did accept, verse 33... Those who did accept his testimony, who received his testimony, they certified that God was true. In essence, they put their seal of approval on God's message. Now, he didn't need that to be true. But when you receive the truth, when you receive God's truth, 
You certify, I believe this is true. I accept that this is true. And John goes on and he says in verse 34, For he whom God has sent speaks the words of God, for God does not give the Spirit by measure. And these words get a little confusing if we're not careful, but think about he who God has sent. Throughout the ages, God had sent prophets to his people. You read through your Old Testament, there are lots of prophets. Some are writing prophets, some are preaching prophets. And they always come and they have a message. And a prophet's message at its heart is not, here's what's going to happen. They didn't always predict the future. They always said, thus saith the Lord. Here's the word of God. And in the prophet's case, they had a specific message from God, sometimes for a specific person, sometimes for a specific time. But they brought a message from God. He whom God has sent speaks the words of God. And they had a measure of the Spirit. The prophet Isaiah could speak to what he was told to speak to. The prophet Ezekiel could speak what he was told to speak. They had a measure of the Spirit of God. Jesus showed up, and it, you, you can't measure how much of the Spirit he's got because he is God in the flesh. So Jesus was greater than any of the earthly prophets because God didn't give him the Spirit by measure in little piecemeal amounts. Jesus, as the Son of God, speaks with the authority of God. That made Jesus limitless in his ability to speak about heavenly things. You know, you could ask Ezra something and say, Ezra, I know you're a prophet. I only ask you about this. And Ezra might say, I don't know. I haven't been given a revelation about that. Elijah and Elisha could speak with authority on what they'd been told. But at times they might say, I don't know. Jesus never said, I don't know about a heavenly matter. Because he'd been given the spirit without measure. Verse 35 says, the father loves the son. And has given all things into his hand. Again, we've seen from the very beginning, the very introductory words of John's gospel, this relationship between God the Father and God the Son. And here John just says, the Father loves the Son. Has given all things into his hand. To to say that the Father loves the Son is, is such an important thing here. The word here is agapao, it's that unconditional love. It is that love of priority. God's love is the reason that Jesus was given the Spirit without measure. And he's given all things into his hand. Verse 36 says, He who believes in the Son has everlasting life, and he who does not believe the Son shall not see life, but the wrath of God abides on him. To believe in the Son entails believing and obeying and doing everything that Jesus said to do. There was a continuous attitude here. Whoever believes in the Son has everlasting life and that's going to be an important theme that we'll pick up in chapter four in just a little bit but now he says i want you to understand something believing in the son is as opposed to not believing and not obeying if you believe the son you have everlasting life if you don't believe the son if there is no faith you won't see everlasting life but that doesn't mean you just miss out instead there is something in store for you he says the wrath of god abides on him Scripture makes it clear. God's grace and God's mercy are are abundant. God's love is overwhelming, but God's wrath is also very real. God's justice will be satisfied. And should you find yourself outside of Christ, not believing in the Son, you'll miss out on the blessing of, of that eternal life with God you will instead find yourself an enemy of God. Divine wrath is consistent with God's nature. It is part of his holiness and who he is. And so John weaves that into a discussion on grace and life. He says there is another choice, though, and you need to know that that's a very real one. In chapter 4, it begins with therefore, which ties it into everything else. We ought to see that the Jesus' success and his troubles there with John and his disciples. Therefore, because of all that, when the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard that Jesus made and baptized more disciples than John, though Jesus himself did not baptize but his disciples, he left Judea and departed again to Galilee. When the Lord, this is a title of respect here, and as John the Gospel writer writes, he says, When the Lord knew that the Pharisees had heard... In other words, this began to get out of hand. The Pharisees may have been those Jews that had the discussion with John and his disciples about purification and and all of the conflict that happened. When all of that happened, Jesus left. Verse 3, when it says he left Judea, refers to a very intentional decision. Almost he abandoned Judea. He goes back to Galilee. Galilee. 
Perhaps it was that, uh, that John didn't, or Jesus didn't want to create any jealousy between John's followers and his. Maybe he stepped back kind of in a similar way to Abraham and Lot when they parted company so as to avoid any trouble. Perhaps Jesus knew the Pharisees were going to cause more and more trouble for him and for John and, and would make it to the point where his ministry was almost impossible to continue. And so Jesus moves to another location. It is important to see that Jesus is focused on his ministry and he makes decisions based on what allows him to continue to minister. And, and so it says that, that because Jesus had heard that, that or the Pharisees had heard that Jesus had made and baptized more disciples than John. And right here you get this little parenthetical reference in verse 2. John said, hey, we want you to know Jesus didn't actually baptize anybody. The disciples baptized. I think you, you could make a lot out of that. You could make a big deal about that. But the truth is what John is saying is it doesn't matter who did the baptizing. And, and nobody can say, oh, well, I was baptized by Jesus because of some sort of claim to fame as if they were somehow better than anyone else. It's not the baptizer that makes the difference. In fact, if you think about it, his disciples would mean that somebody out there was a Christian and said, you know what, I'm a Christian because Judas Iscariot baptized me. Can you imagine? And yet that baptism was just as valid. The role of God, the role of the blood of Christ was not affected by the baptizer. Baptism is neither validated nor invalidated by the identity of the one who does it based on the faith of the one who comes to Christ and the faith of God who does the saving in baptism. And the Pharisees get word that this competition between Jesus and John is heating up and Jesus simply says, you know what, we're going to change the venue, change the setting. There won't be a competition between us. And so he left Judea and he came to Galilee. And verse 4 says something really, really interesting but he needed to go through Samaria. And maybe we miss that because we're not as familiar with geography as they would be of the Holy Land. Because the truth is, if you are headed back to Galilee from Judea, you didn't need to go through Samaria. It was the shortest way, it was the straightest route, but you could take the long way around. In fact, Jews regularly did. They didn't like Samaritans. Samaritans were the wrong side of town. They were the wrong people. You avoided them. And so they tended to travel the long way around, and they would often avoid Samaria. And yet verse 4 says he needed to go through Samaria. It was necessary is literally what the Greek word means there. Jesus knew he had a divine appointment to keep. And so he goes through and passes through Samaria. And perhaps the divine appointment he was to keep was simply one to break down some barriers to say you know what this is a this is a tradition of yours you don't like them they don't like you you guys argue about the same stuff over and over and over again and Jesus said I'm here to break down those barriers and so he travels through Samaria likely whenever he sets his course through Samaria the disciples got a little bit uncomfortable hey Jesus don't you want to go the traditional route where we go around Samaria and he says no it's necessary we need to go through Samaria. Uh, Samaria is a region. It's named for its capital city, which is also named Samaria. They refer to the Samaritans. They are the descendants from that northern kingdom uh, of Israel. They were the ones who, after their captivity, the, the, their captors take, took and mixed them up so much so that the faith they had was no longer Jewish faith. It was this crazy mixing and mingling of all sorts of different religious beliefs and truly the northern kingdom simply ceases to exist. And while they still cling to some belief in those first five books of the Bible, the Samaritans are not considered to be Jews. In fact, the Jews considered them to be half-breeds. It is this region that Jesus goes through. And verse 5 says, So he came to a city of Samaria, which is called Sychar, near the plot of ground that Jacob gave to his son Joseph. Jesus comes to a specific town, a town that likely can still be identified even today on the southern slopes of Mount Ebal right there. And he refers to an incident that happens all the way back in Genesis to some ground that Jacob had given to his son Joseph. When, when the Israelites, when, when Joseph goes down into Egypt and then he brings his father and his brothers and all of them with them, when Jacob dies, 
just before his death in Egypt, he bequeathed that property to his son Joseph. You can read about that in Genesis chapter 48. And Jacob dies there in Egypt. Joseph also dies in Egypt. And he says, before he dies, when you go out of here, because God's going to bring you out of here one day, when you go out of here, take my bones with you. And sure enough, in Exodus... The people of Israel, the children of Israel, bring the bones of Joseph with them as they leave Egypt. And we find out after they conquer Canaan, they get to the land of Shechem. And in Joshua chapter 24, they buried Joseph's bones. The word syker may well mean the town of the sepulcher. It may be that this is the town where Joseph was buried. And so they get to this spot, this important spot, a spot that is sacred to Jews and yet now lives in the region of the Samaritans. And they come to this spot. In verse 6, it says Jacob's well was there. It it simply identifies this well. It doesn't tell us anything else about it, but apparently the people of the day knew exactly what they were talking about. Jacob's well was there, and Jesus, being wearied from his journey, sat thus by the well. It was about the sixth hour. According to Jewish time, that would have been high noon. If John is following Roman time. That would have been 6 o'clock in the evening. Either way, you could see somebody needing a rest. Perhaps it's the middle of the day. That was a good time to sit and take a rest. Or perhaps it was coming near the end of the day and Jesus needed a break. Either way, it says that Jesus was wearied from his journey. And the word there literally means he was wearied to the point of exhaustion. And he sat down. John shows us Jesus as a human being. Jesus is one who gets tired from time to time. As he lived this life, we're going to see that Jesus, it's in John's gospel where we see that Jesus wept. We see that Jesus is tired. We see that Jesus gets angry. We see that Jesus sometimes withdraws and needs a little bit of alone time. We'll see Jesus in lots of different situations where John shows us Jesus was a real human being. You could only do that if you'd been with him and seen all of that. John could have told you exactly what Jesus looked like when he got flustered. John could have told you what Jesus looked like here when he was weary to the point of exhaustion. Perhaps Jesus even said, guys, I got to sit down and we're going to see it appears the disciples go on into town. So maybe they say, Jesus, come on. He says, no, I can't go any further. Maybe Jesus got tired even before the other disciples did. And Jesus is wearied and he sat down by the well. That's where we're going to tie up our study today. We'll pick up in verse 7 next week as we see something amazing that happens. If it wasn't bad enough that we have to go through this region of the Samaritans, now we're going to have to actually talk to one of them. And it won't even be one of the good Samaritans if there is such a thing. It's going to be one of the ones that everybody knows about. And this Samaritan woman that we meet has a conversation with Jesus that impacts your faith and mine even today. And we are blessed because of the conversation that they have. We'll study that next week. Thank you for joining us for Bible class this morning. I would invite you to to click on the next video and join us for worship as well. We're thankful that you are studying with us online. And as soon as we can be back together, we invite you to be with us in person every chance that you get. Let's pray as we close today. Oh God, our Father, you are a God who loved your son Jesus and who loves us. And Father, we see your love on display in every verse of John's gospel. Thank you for this story of the life of Jesus. And God, we pray that you will bless us with wisdom to understand what we read. We want to be disciples of Jesus, and we want to understand the teachings of Jesus and apply them to our lives. Guide us and give us wisdom as we do that. Watch over us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen.